Now let's get started. If uh, you would back up just a bit, you're in 2 Kings 1. Uh, we're following the life of Elijah, which means from time to time I got to skip a chapter because there are some stories in here where Elijah's off the scene, he's not mentioned. And so I'm not necessarily just preaching through First uh, and Second Kings, but we're following the life of Elijah, and so uh, kind of coming quickly to an end as he will pass on the scene, and then Elisha will take his his spot. So, just to fill in some blanks that we haven't read in the story, uh, I want to introduce ah- Ahaziah, the son of Ahab. First uh, Kings twenty-two. Look at verse forty. It says, So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his stead. Go down to verse 49. Then said Ahaziah the son of Ahab unto Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with thy servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not. And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David uh, his father. And Jehoram his son reigned in his stead. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, uh, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way, uh, in, in, um, walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. Now, you remember the what we missed a little bit in the other stories is talking a little bit about the, uh, the allies joining together, Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And if you remember, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom at this time are split. You've got just basically what we just call Israel, and then you got Judah. And sometimes we get mixed up because the Jews were actually the southern tribe, but we just kind of tend to call them all Jews. And sometimes it is does seem to be interchangeable in the Bible, so it's kind of confusing. But when you keep those separate, uh, it helps you understand the story. Interesting thing, of the northern kingdom, every king that came was bad. I mean, every king was just wicked, went after other gods, and, uh, uh, and, and all. It doesn't mean that none of them were saved, but they all did wickedly. And in fact, I tried to show uh, where Ahab, I believe, there's good evidence by just following the, the narrative that he was actually saved, but he just very far removed uh, from the Lord. <clears throat> However, uh, in the southern kingdom, you have a mixture, some good kings, some bad kings. Jehoshaphat seems to be a pretty good guy. Uh, certainly, he made some mistakes, and it talks about that. But uh, now we've got these guys who formed an alliance, okay? And so then you get into chapter uh, 2 here, and it continues with the story of Ahaziah. Then Moab uh, rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria. Now, what is a lattice? you know, I think of a lattice as like a, just a very weak structure. Sometimes I even thought of it like a net or like, you know, here's what's in my mind. I, I might be totally wrong on this, but, you know, on a trailer or something where they well, they block off the space underneath the trailer by putting, the, uh, uh, you know, the wooden planks that go this way and that way, you know, <laughs> and it's just really light. That's what I got in my mind, okay? But there's this idea of some kind of weak, like netting or something like that that was in his ceiling. Now, if I'm way off on that, that just disregard. But here's what we do know. He fell through, <laughs> okay? How many have ever fallen through uh, a, the, a roof? Like, uh, you know, like well, you just stand, you're up in the attic or something like that and your foot goes through the roof. Nobody? Brother Austin, I'm surprised you never have. Easy practices uh, safety on on the workforce. Uh, I was in Oklahoma City, and uh, one time I was up there trying to clean stuff up. There's all this stuff in the attic, and my wife's in the kitchen underneath me, and she's cooking. And all of a sudden, whoosh, here comes my foot down through the, through the ceiling. Now, thankfully, the rafters are kind of close together, and so it was just my foot, and I kind of got stuck. And I was just thinking, now what do I do? All the all the really super old insulation was all over the ground, and how am I going to fix the ceiling? And uh, it was it was 
real disturbing. But this is case. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know why he's up there. Uh, I don't know how he falls, but he falls through the lattice and uh, is injured. Now, the way I understand it, this word sick and even disease isn't necessarily like we think about somebody sick <laughs> and they got a disease, right? That was kind of like a catch-all phrase back in the 1600s. And I, have, I didn't even look to see what modern translations do with that because I don't really care. But, uh, but here's what verse 2 says. He fell down the lattice in the upper chamber and was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, uh, whether I shall recover of this disease. Now, you, you're thinking like northern kingdom, southern kingdom, whatever, you're still supposed to be part of the 12 tribes of Israel. You're supposed to be God's people. What is going on with seeking after Beelzebub? <laughs> going after Baal, like Ahab, you know, for many years because of his marriage with Jezebel, uh, he's following Baal and going after the Baal and following the prophets of Baal. Now, he does come around uh, you know, after, after Elijah, you know, has the, the, the showdown, you know, where the altars, uh, sacrifice is put on the altars and, and their God, uh, gods are challenged to consume this sacrifice. And of course, Elijah's God, the true God, uh, he does that 400 prophets of Baal are killed. And it seems like, although Jezebel's pretty upset about it, it seems like Ahab just kind of goes back to, uh, in fact, I'll mention it briefly here in a minute, but one of the stories we missed was the story of Micaiah and the 400 prophets that are, now these are prophets of the Lord, albeit they're prophesying like what he wants them to hear. And he's up and he doesn't like Micaiah because Micaiah doesn't ever prophesy good concerning him, but only evil. But look, he's still now searching these prophets supposedly of the Lord, right? <laughs> At least he claims to be a Christian, although very weak and, uh, and still just only uh, interested in appeasing, you know, what he wants to be able to do. But anyway, I'm getting off a little bit. Uh, so we see here that uh, this guy sends his uh, messengers and says, go inquire of Beelzebub. And on his way, on, on the messenger's way to go do that, they come across Elijah. And Elijah's just doing his thing, whatever, I don't know, laying down by the brook, uh, as his maybe habit was to, uh, to do. And, and uh, he sees these guys, uh, oh, God tells him, you know, that the you, I got a job for you to do. Let's just read it. Verse three, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say unto them, is it not because there is no, not a God in Israel that ye go and inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, why are ye now turned back? So messengers are going to do what uh, their king uh, Ahaziah had told them to do. And so they're going to seek uh, counsel from Beelzebub. And on the way, they meet Elijah, this hairy man. Now, I started to preach a message on being a hairy man. <laughs> <laughs> I actually preached a message one time. It's a long story, but it was on uh, e, uh, uh, Jacob and Esau. You know, he's like, this was, a, I, I preached it to the teens. And it was, it was on that verse where he says, I'm, uh, my brother's a hairy man, but I'm a smooth man. And it talked about the difference between the smooth man and the hairy man. <laughs> and maybe that would have been a good message. We'll save it for another day. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I love the way that when they come across God's people, and I just talked about this morning in Sunday school, uh, Micaiah, since I didn't get to preach Micaiah, story of Micaiah here because we're following Elijah, I said, hey, we'll just, I'll just do that in Sunday school. And I, <laughs> so I got to preach on that. And it's like every time there's this man of God, they just don't fit in the norm. And people are just kind of like, you know, hey, that guy out there, he just like, he rubs me the wrong way. And, and I don't know what it is about the fact that he's a hairy man and he's got these hairy garments and a leather girdle. And, and uh, here he is, you know, eating locusts and honey. I mean, right. That's what uh, John the Baptist is. I'm talking about all these people that are just, they seem odd. They seem bizarre. You know, sometimes I don't think I'm odd enough to be a man of God. <laughs> 
not, I'm not hairy enough. I'm not dynamic enough, something. But the fact, fact is, people who really stand out. Now, here's an interesting thought. I'm uh, getting off. I'm going to talk about Micaiah here in a, li a little bit. <clears throat> Until chapter 21, is it 20 or 21? You don't ever hear of Micaiah. And after the end of that chapter, you don't ever hear about him again. So it's like, who is Micaiah? He's, he's kind of like a nobody. In fact, it seems like he spends the rest of his days in jail, eating just the bread that they allow him to have and the water they allow him to have to stay alive. But here's a man that just stood before the king, and he said, hey, these 400 prophets are preaching wrong, and, and, and here's what God really said, and he preaches the truth, and they hate him for it. And the king says, lock him up. And he's just like, whatever. And the king's like, hey, when I return, I'll take care of you. And he says, if you return, then I'm not a prophet of God because God told me you're not going to return. I mean, he's just very bold. And, and it's like when you see these men of God in the Bible, they really kind of stand out to you. And nowadays, quite honestly, if you see a guy like that, everybody's like, oh, watch out for that guy. He's a heretic or something like that. And I'm just thinking like, well, not really necessarily. Now, they could be just because they're just because they're, you know, they stand out a little bit doesn't make them good guys. But. In the Bible, like you see those guys, they're not typically well-liked and well-loved. And so, uh, so this is the case. They come across Elijah, and he stands out, and there's kind of like this. You get the sense like they just approach him real cautiously, like, oh, no, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? And they go up to him, and, uh, and he tells them what God said. He says uh, to King Ahaziah, uh, you know, you're not going to come off that bed. You're not going to get better. You don't have to go seek the God of, uh, uh, of Ekron, the Beelzebub, because I'll tell you right now, God said you're not going to get any better. Now, in this story, Elijah is telling, he's delivering a message that at the end of the day isn't really going to change anything in the sense that, you know, it's not like Ahaziah is going to do anything differently. Everything's going to happen just the way Elijah said it's going to happen. And going back to Micaiah, you know, Micaiah told them, hey, don't go up to Ramoth Gilead. You're going to die. They did it anyway, and they died. And it got me thinking, like, you know, there's a lot of things that we see in the Bible where it's like, it's like, what's the, what's the purpose of even doing that? You know? So, I mean, the title of the message is why deliver the message of death? It's like, if the guy's going to die anyway, like why go say, Hey, you're going to die. How is that going to change? And I mean, he's not going to listen to you anyway. God's already said that he's going to die. And so you might read this and other messages like this and see, I mean, other uh, parts of scripture like this and say like, what is the point? Let me give you a few examples. Have you ever thought about this? Why pray for something if you know that God already knows the answer? He already knows what's best. He already knows maybe what's going to happen. You know, here's a, a couple of, you know, a thought about that is, is uh, for instance, David. You know, David's, you know, he knows he's being punished for a sin that he committed. And now his child that he had with Bathsheba from committing adultery he knows that that child's going to die. God's pretty much already let him know that. But the whole time that child's dying, he's fasting and he's praying and uh, he's mourning and uh, he's not sleeping or anything like that because he doesn't want the child to die and he's begging God to spare his life. And God doesn't. And so it's like, you might think like, was he wrong for even praying? Like, why pray if God already is, is going to do what he's going to do? And obviously we don't believe in Cal the Calvinist idea that says, hey, it's already just set in stone. God's just, uh, you know, that's one way of looking. I say Calvinism, but, but really it's just a whole doctrine of just predetermined, like everything God's going to do is predetermined. Everything happens for a reason and all that kind of logic. <clears throat> one might ask, like, what is the benefit of praying? In my own life, I know there's been times where I sat down to pray and I almost felt like, What's the point? Like I just at this point might just was well, leave it in God's hands. He knows what's going to going to be the outcome, so why pray about it? Maybe even hey, God knows what's best. You know, what why should I pray for what's different for a different outcome than what he's already going to give? 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? These are the kind of thoughts that you might think, like, I don't understand why do it. Uh, here's another question that's puzzled me, and I brought this up when we went through the Revelation series. Like, why does the 144,000, I mean, that's a lot of folks, right? I don't know if they're spread all over throughout the earth or, 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 or what's, what's left of it anyway, uh, but they're continuing as, the, as God's pouring out His wrath on the earth, this 144,000 are going about preaching the gospel, preaching something. Maybe they're just preaching, uh, you know, hellfire, hey, you're about to die or whatever. But what is their purpose for being here? Because we see in, throughout Revelation, nobody repents. That I, as far as we can tell, nobody repents. They just keep on wicked ways, even though God's pouring out the wrath. And you think that they would be like, oh, God, please have mercy, no more. But really, they're not. And they're seeking to die, but they can't die. And you see all this kind of stuff. And you're like, what's the point of having 144,000? Or what's the point of having, bring back Elijah and Moses, the two witnesses. I guess I don't know 100% that it's them, but the two witnesses that are preaching. Uh, apparently, there's going to be a great uh, presence. I'm guessing online presence, it seems like, because the whole world's going to be watching them at the same time. And they're going to be put to death, and they're going to lie in the streets at Jerusalem. And it's like, what was their purpose? Like, why were they going? Why, why did God bring them here? You know, obviously, they get in some fights, and, you know, they're devouring people, you know, however, however the Bible says. But what is their point? Why do they? What's the point of doing all these things if the end result doesn't seem to have a purpose? Why deliver the message of death? If they're just going to die anyway, like why tell them? So let me give you some thoughts that I'm going to try to give a little bit of an answer for that. The first one is so uh, so obvious and uh, maybe even cliche that you know I almost hesitate to say it, but I, it's 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 very important. Here's the first answer: Why do that? Even if you know the outcome is going to be such and such, because God told you to. <laughs> Why did Elijah go tell a man who's going to die anyway, you're going to die? Well, the first reason is God told him to. God came to him and said, Elijah, you know, here's what's going to happen. These messengers are going to come and you need to tell them this. So Elijah just did it. And the truth is, many times things aren't going to make sense to us. And we're just following God's plans. We're following what he wants us to do. And we're like, it doesn't even make sense. Like, I don't even know what it's going to accomplish. Why do it? Well, there is a reason and there is something that it's going to accomplish, but forget about that. If you don't understand it or you're kind of confused about it, that's okay, but you still do it. Just do it because God said to do it. If you're reading in, your, in his word and he's telling you to do it and you don't understand why, what's the benefit of this? Do it anyway. All right. Uh, and uh, soul winning is something that comes to mind because, you know, I mean, I think that we see here that soul winning works. Like we see people getting saved. We talk to them. We have an idea, uh, you know, sure. You know, can we say that not a hundred percent of those people that call on that we think are calling on the Lord and we think are believing in the Lord are saved? No, we don't, we don't know that. We don't know their heart. We don't know if they're lying to us or what, <clears throat> but we do see people getting saved. We do know that the gospel is getting out there. Seeds are being planted. We can see a lot of things, but somebody will say, yeah, but how many of those people are in church? You know, how many of those guys came to your church? How many got baptized? How many? And so here's the consensus among most even independent Baptist churches, unfortunately, soul winning doesn't work, right? We've got to figure out another way to do it. We got to do this. We got to have programs. We got to and the idea of, you know what, we're just going to keep soul winning anyway, is the fact that God told us to do it. Amen. He said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He shows us how to do it. He goes to every house, you know, every house and, they, and, they, uh, and this is a, a model that was kind of set, and we understand. That seems to be now. If we lived in a country where, you know, every house is like a compound, and you can't get in because there's a gate, and there's just no way to get in, uh, so what's the point going door to door? We would have to come up with another strategy. Like, where are the people hanging out? How can we get to the, the masses of people? Where I go to the mall or something like that. We would have to change our, our strategy. But we're still in a time in the United States where we can pretty much knock on every door. Even if the, even if the sign says no soliciting. I mean, 
got to present the whole gospel to someone the other day. The two signs, no soliciting right here, no soliciting right here. I mean, that close together, you know that guy was trying to say something, but he still listened. <laughs> you know, he was still polite. There was nothing, you know, uh, you go into a complex like a duplex or, uh, or, you know, apartments or something like that. And you know, man, they don't want us here. But you know what? We have the freedom in the United States that you can still keep on knocking and you're pr probably nothing's going to happen. People are still going to listen. People are still going to get saved. And so while we can do it, why would we not do it if Jesus said to it? People say, well, it's not growing the church. You're not seeing a bunch of people coming in. You got to go do the bus routes and you got to offer these programs and you got to do all that. And I'm thinking, I don't see that in the Bible. Why do we do it? Even if it seems like to us, it seems like on the surface it's not working, even though we know it is, but it seems like it's not working. Why do it? Because God said so. And that's the way we got to address everything. So why would I preach a certain message if no one's going to if, if these people aren't going to listen? Because God said so. Why should I tell somebody, you know, about uh, something that they're not going to listen to? They don't care about anyway, uh, you know, because God said so. Why should I talk to? Uh, we've had people in the we've had people in here before that are like. You know, hey, there's a rainbow flag on the door. I'm not going to knock on that door uh, because they're reprobate and they can't be saved. <clears throat> Look, if they're reprobate, they can't be saved. I agree with that doctrine. But why is it that we would go ahead and knock on a door anyway without logic, without trying to figure out the blank? Well, because God said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. So we go and we just preach the gospel, hoping that God knows what he's doing and maybe somebody's going to get saved. <laughs> maybe they're not. But you know what? Even if we go to preach to somebody who we know aren't going to get saved, we still wouldn't be doing anything wrong. You know what we would be doing? Here, here's, a, uh, here's one thing I've heard said before. Like, we're not, we're, not always, we're not always so winning. Sometimes we're so warning. Have you ever heard that? And I would go far to say sometimes... Sometimes we're even reprobating people. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We're not reprobating them, but what I mean is we're giving them that last chance. Like, hey, you don't want to listen to me, but I'm going to tell you uh, as the mouth of God, right? I'm telling you what God says. If you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are going to die and go to hell. And they say, I don't believe that stuff. Well, you just gave them their last chance. And you say, well, I don't want to do that. Well, look, they're going to die and go to hell anyway. Why not try to give them the gospel that one time? You don't know, okay, is the secret, I mean, is the, is the, is the answer. But, that does, but I'm not there yet, I'm getting ahead of myself. But number one, you do it because God said so. And I got off a little bit on the, on the, the reprobate thing that's not even in my notes, but uh, here's what the Bible says about, for instance, why pray? Why pray if God already knows the answer and he knows what, you know, what's, what we need, he knows what's best, all that stuff. Well, because the Bible says to pray. Philippians 6, 4, 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Somebody's sick, right? I don't know what's wrong with me. I guess maybe God just wants me to have, maybe he's punishing me. Maybe he's, well, why go and have somebody pray for you, right? Because the Bible says. James 5, 14 says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with, uh, with oil in the name of the Lord. So before you even try to reason out, like, well, I just don't think it's even worth praying about. I don't even think I need to pray. Look, the Bible says to pray. Make your requests known. Uh, you know, if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And, uh, and who, who's, uh, who is... <laughs> something about being liberal because uh, I don't like the word liberal, but <laughs> and give it to all men liberally and abradeth not. Okay. So he's saying, look, you know, if you lack wisdom, ask God. These are the things that the Bible tells us to do. Why are the 144,000 and the two witnesses there in the, when God's pouring out his wrath and nobody's getting saved? Well, because God told them to, God sent them there. Why do we preach the gospel to someone who's not going to receive it? Because God told us to. Look at uh, Micaiah, I'm not Micaiah, look at 1 Kings 22, the story of Micaiah. 1 Kings 22, look at verse 14. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord said unto, saith unto me, that will I speak. 
I love that. Got him in trouble. He ended up in jail. Uh, you know, it made the forty, the four hundred prophets of the Lord mad. It made the messenger that came to to Micaiah. Okay, so here's what happened: Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, and Ahab. Uh, you know, they're trying to make this alliance. Jehoshaphat is apparently the spiritual one and says, Hey, Ahab, don't you think we ought to seek the Lord, inquire upon the Lord and see whether we ought to go up to Ramoth Gilead or not? And he says, he says, okay, yeah, sure. So he asks his 400 prophets, should we go up? And they're like, oh yeah, go up. God's going to bless and you're going to take Ramoth Gilead. Everything's good. You're going to conquer Syria. Everything's going to be great. But Jehoshaphat, something inside, like a Kind of like that feeling you get the Holy Spirit sometimes says, I don't care what everybody's saying. Something's not right. This doesn't, I don't think this is what the Lord, this isn't the truth. <clears throat> Something's not right. Josh Fett says, well, isn't there somebody else, you know, that can, that we can inquire upon? Ahab's like, well, there's this one guy, but I hate him because he always prophesies uh, evil concerning me and not good. So he literally sends a messenger to go get, uh, to go get uh, Micaiah. And the messenger says, all right, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, all right, Micaiah, please, <laughs> please. All 400 prophets are in agreement. They're all telling Ahaz what he wants to hear. They're saying, go up. Will you please just go tell him the same thing that the 400 are doing? And he says, look, I'm going to tell him what God tells me to tell him. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that's not popular today. You got not only do you have the leaders of the United States and the leaders of the churches and the schools and anybody in authority, you got them saying, hey, we'll tell you what to think. We'll tell you what to say. We'll tell you what you're allowed to do. You know, and then you got these these preachers that are like, nope, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And I'm going to stand with, with what God tells me to do. And then you got the who's getting mad. The preachers. <laughs> All the preachers that are like, hey, will you guys just chill out? You're making us look bad. You know, will you just say the same things that we're saying so, and not stir the waters and uh, ruffle feathers? Will you just say what's popular to say? And guys like Micaiah and guys like Elijah are like, no, I'm going to say what God told me to say. And that's what we have to stand uh, firm on. Number two, though, why deliver a message of death? Okay, why the, the basics of what I'm trying to get at is why do something that seems like has no purpose, okay? Why deliver the message of death? Number two, God wants to declare himself the victor. Uh, he wants to declare himself the victor, okay? So so here's, here's what's going on. And again, we don't know. You got to remember, you don't know all the details. You don't know who's going to hear what. You don't know uh, how it's going to come back how word's going to get spread around or whatever. But God will send his people to do something because what he's doing is he's proclaiming to the people that he is who he says he is. He's declaring himself the victor. And, uh, and when we declare God's word to somebody and we tell it just like it is, like the Bible says, uh, one thing to remember is when you do that, you say, hey, I'm just telling you exactly what I see in the Bible, exactly what I believe to be true from the, based on God's word. There's no reason to ever be ashamed of that. And I think that's a big problem that we have is like, well, I don't really want to say that I believe that because people are going to get offended. They're not going to like that. No, you've got to say, you got to tell the truth. And I think the, a lot of churches really drop the ball on this because they go out there knocking on doors and passing out the tracks that are very, very uh, 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 almost disguised not to tell them really who they are or what they believe. Like That's why a lot of people drop the name Baptist or drop the name, you know, just kind of like this community church or something. We don't want to tell them what we believe. You don't know if you're going into like a charismatic church or what, right? Because they're just trying to, they're just trying to get you in there. Hey, just forget about what kind of church we are. Just come in. We've, we really love people and we got great music and we got all this kind of stuff and they're trying to get them in. Well, when I designed, when I became the pastor and I designed uh, the track that we were going to be giving out whenever we go soul winning, uh, the lady that was designing the track you know, I, I sent her all the information to put on there and she put on the, the rough draft. The first one that I sent her, she actually sent me something on uh, messenger, however we were communicating. And it was like, are you trying to turn people away from your church or what? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I think if the average person read that, they wouldn't want to come to your church. 
And so I compromised a little bit and let her change it and like fluff it up a little bit. But the first version was basically saying, look, I'm going to, it's like, I'm going to be honest with you. This church isn't for everybody. Some people aren't going to like the preaching. Some people aren't going to like that. And she's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're supposed to, she's so used to like, hey, you just camouflage that. Don't tell them you're King James only. Don't tell them that you have your standards of this and that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I didn't put a lot of that in there. But do you see what I'm saying? Like, I would rather tell somebody at the door exactly what we believe, exactly who we are, you know, and then whenever they come, they're not surprised. Rather than to just like get them in the door, hey, are you are you comfortable? Are you happy? Are you still giving your tithes and offerings? <laughs> All right, now let me just slowly, you know, turn up the heat and show you where we are. Forget that. It's never going to work, right? You got to start by just standing on the truth. And when somebody hears the truth and they're just like, whoa, I don't know what to do with that. Then you have a conversation. You say, look, it's not my word. It's the word of God. And you show them that this is what the Lord said. But at the end of the day, we don't have to be ashamed about the message because it's God's message. And it's real tempting just to, if you're trying to fit in with the popular crowd, you're trying to do, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to say something that is going to be unpopular because you're like, man, that's going to be embarrassing or they're going to think I'm some kind of freak or, you know, uh, they're going to think that I'm my standards of dress or how I conduct myself or the language I use or whatever is too, you know, uh, it's too weird or something. Forget that. Forget that. Just stand on what uh, the God's word and the spirit is, is, is telling you to do. So a great example of the fact that God allows things to happen so that he can show himself the victor would be the, uh, the children of Israel in, uh, in coming out of Egypt. Okay, so here they are. They're in Egypt. And God literally tells Moses, you know, go say, let my people go, but Pharaoh's not going to let them go. Tell him, if you don't let them go, I'm going to perform this, uh, you know, you're going to receive this plague from God. And he tells Moses, he says, Pharaoh's not going to let them go. <laughs> he does this over and over. And the only ones that are getting mad at him are his own people. The, the, the Israelites are like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're making our life harder, and are you trying to, you know, get us in trouble? What are you doing? But he is just going by what the Lord said to do. But the Lord tells us in the Bible, and you kind of read between the lines anyway and see how he's pouring out. And I think maybe in the uh, when God pours his wrath out upon the earth at the in Revelation, uh, and you see all the plagues. I mean, there's some similarities here. I think he's kind of doing the same thing. But in uh, in Exodus. When he pours out those plagues, he's specifically destroying things that these people, uh, they had, you know, the God of this, of the river, you know, the Nile River, or the God of this, the God of that. And all these plagues, you know, that, 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 that he is uh, 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 pouring out, it's like showing that God is the one who's really in control. And those false gods that you're claiming to be gods, they don't know anything. These idols that you're worshiping, they can't do anything. They have no power. He's showing whoever will listen. Look, thousands of years later, we're still reading this story and we're still getting this message. He probably didn't know that was going to happen whenever he was doing what God told him to do. But he's just doing it and God is showing his greatness and his power over these false gods. And uh, and he's and he's showing it. So at the end of all of the, he says some things before as well, but at the end of all the plagues in Exodus 12, 12, he says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. This is the final one, the Passover. He says, I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So you're like, well, why, you know, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Why are you still preaching to Pharaoh? All the people are following him. The, the sorcerers don't believe you. They're still trying to do their own uh, miracles and they're recreating them and stuff like that. Like, what's the point of this? Well, the point is, first of all, God said, do it. So do it. Second of all, God said, uh, I'm going to declare myself to be more powerful than their gods. And so he goes and by just doing what God tells him to do, God ends up getting the glory for that. Well, look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, after Moses gets the, uh, you know, so they've been out of, it, of uh, Egypt for a while now, and he gets the Ten Commandments, and they're getting ready to go into the Promised Land. Uh, of course, they're... Of 
course, they uh, mess things up and get wander for 40 years. But Deuteronomy 32, Moses, uh, he's uh, in 31, 30, it says, And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And so chapter 32 is the song that he's singing or speaking. And I'm just going to go through just a few parts of it. Look at verse 4. He is the rock. All right, capital R. Interesting in the New Testament, it talks about Jesus being that rock. Okay, so a lot of times in the Old Testament, there's this reference to the rock. You think about the rock, the foundation, the solid structure, you know, upon which we build our faith, uh, build upon the faith. And, and it says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Look at verse 16. They, provi uh, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, little g. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To, God, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that began, uh, begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Look at uh, verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Look at... Uh, Verse 39, see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. You know, you don't, you know, ultimately Jesus said, hey, don't fear him that can kill you. But after that, have no power to destroy your, body, your soul. He said, fear him. And I'm messing up the, the verse, but fear him, which, which can kill both soul and your body and soul. Right in hell, and uh, and so look, God is the one who determines if you live or you die. God is the one who determines if a person goes to heaven or goes to hell. And I'm thankful He gave us the plan. We know how to go to heaven, uh, but He's the one that has that power. I, uh, He says, kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. And so anyway, what we see here is that God gets the glory in the end, no matter what. And so even though he's long suffering, he's patient, he's not willing that any should perish. I mean, he's, you know, he's wanting the truth to get out. <clears throat> he, whether or not anyone's going to turn to him, he's declaring himself victor. And uh, we should have that mentality when we're preaching and somebody doesn't believe in the Bible and they're scoffing at us and, and they're saying how, you know, ignorant we are and all this kind of stuff, man, you know, don't, don't be ashamed of that. And don't be like, Oh man, I mean, this guy's got a point. Like I'm not very smart. <laughs> Who cares? Just preach what the Bible says and don't be ashamed of that. Proclaim it. God's the one that's going to get glory in the end. You know, I don't know if, if that person's not going to recount sometime when he's standing before God. Hey, I remember that time that Christian came and preached the gospel to me. <laughs> right. And I was giving him a hard time and rejecting it. All right, so uh, this both strengthens the faith of the people that are taking part in declaring it, you know, because I don't know about you, but I get strengthened every time I preach, every time I, I preach the gospel or I stand up here from the pulpit and I preach the truth, it strengthens my faith and it strengthens uh, just, you know, my understanding of, of God's word and uh, also those people that are, are listening to it. Now, maybe the person that you're preaching to is never going to get saved. Maybe the person that you're, you're, you know, you're preached to just doesn't believe or whatever, but there might be somebody else who's listening. And they are, uh, this is what we actually see. Go back to our text. 2 Kings 1, look at verse 15. <clears throat> Hey, let me see here. Let's actually look at verse 13. And he sent again a captain uh, of the third 50 with his 50. And this third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah 
and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50, thy servants, be precious in thy sight. You know what's really cool to watch Jesus' ministry as you read the Gospels and Jesus is preaching, and a lot of times there's people following him that are scoffing and mocking. There's Pharisees that don't want anything to do with what he's saying. And he keeps on preaching, and it's just like, man, nobody's listening, nobody's believing. But then all of a sudden you'll find all these people that are like, hey, we want to hear some more about this. You see the same thing with the Apostle Paul. We want to hear more about this. We want to follow you. We believe you are the one. You know what I mean? So when we just go out doing it and you seem like, hey, nobody's listening, hey, there could be that one person that is listening, you know, and they might actually, uh, uh, under, you know, they might actually understand and want to know more. The truth is we never know when God is going to show mercy on somebody. You know, we never know. There's so many things in the Bible that it sounds like it's just cut and dry. Hey, this is what is going to happen. You know, Nineveh in 40 days, you know, jo Jonah would say, Nineveh in 40 days, God said, you're going to be destroyed. That's what God said. They're going to be destroyed in 40 days. But was Nineveh ever destroyed? No. And that's why Jonah didn't want to go in the first place because he didn't want God to show mercy on them. But when he preached, hey, God said you're going to be destroyed in 40 days and the whole city you know, all it took was just one king to say, you know what, I want to get on God's good side. And they all repented and they all sought the Lord and they said, hey, we'll, we'll stop doing what we're doing. And so God showed mercy upon them. Now, everything written, everything that was being preached, it's like, hey, that's it. Too late for you, buddy. You're going to die. But then whenever they preach, you know, we, you see that somebody's going to say, look at Joel chapter 2. I'll try to wrap this up. Joel chapter 2, what a great chapter. A lot of deep prophecy here. <clears throat> Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 11. And the Lord, this is all talking about end time stuff. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Therefore also, now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? And leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Who knows, <laughs> you know, if that person's going to change or not? You're like, no, that's it. It's it. It's the end for this guy. Well, that's not your decision to make. And so you preach, and then who knows? God could show mercy upon that person that you're preaching to. So all of a sudden, you're thinking David. And it's interesting, though, this isn't used in a salvation context because he's saying you know he's talking about thy people you know so anyway but uh yeah he says if who knows uh let me see here uh he talks about returning unto the lord your god so he's already their god they just walk they just walked uh outside of the way so anyway i don't want to get too far on that but so now you think about the story of david and here's david saying you know what i messed up terrible sin god said as a result my child's going to get sick and he's probably not going to make it. But David's like, well, who knows if God might repent and change that? You know, who knows if God might, you know, show mercy on me and spare my child. So what's he do? Fast and praise and beseeches the Lord. Now he's not mad at God when God doesn't give him that because that was what was determined to begin with. The apostle Paul says, man, this thorn in the flesh, God, please take it away from me. Pray, he besought him three times, take it away from me. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. But he still asks because who knows if God will take it away. And he tells us, so first of all, uh, God told you to, to do it. Second of all, do it because it's going to declare God the victor. To, to those who are watching and even to yourself as you, uh, as you strengthen yourself in, in uh, preaching his word. Number three, who knows? You know, God wants to offer the last call for repentance and who knows? 
uh, but somebody might <clears throat> repent. And I even think about that when I read the Bible and I consider like where people are going to be in the next however many years before uh, uh, God comes back and how bad it's going to get, the persecution, all that stuff. And it's like, it's like you know, I, I don't think there's any hope. I mean, I'm all, I almost get like that sometimes if you hear me talk about our country right now. <laughs> it's like, I just think there's no hope. America's just got to be destroyed. Just, you know, but obviously when you start thinking about it, you're like, you know, our job isn't to just say, you know what, that's it. I literally texted my wife the other day and said, man, sometimes I just want to move into the mountains and not tell anybody where we're going and just go off the grid and just who's who's with me there. <laughs> we'll start a little compound. No, that's that's weird. <laughs> Wear Nike shoes and get the same haircuts. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, just don't worry about it. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, no, but I was, seriously, I was like, man, sometimes it's just like, I just want to get away and just forget about all that stuff. But we know as Christians, that's not what God's called us to do. He's called us to go preach the gospel. He's called us to keep living for him, even in a world that rejects him and doesn't want anything to do with him. He wants us to keep preaching the truth, even if it's not possible. And he wants us to keep doing that for whatever reasons, but ultimately to give him the glory in the end and hopefully turn people to repentance. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your bold, be strong in our faith and, and, uh, and in our convictions. Help us uh, stand for the truth of your word and to not be ashamed of ever preaching anything that you uh, have told us in your word is right. I pray that you'll be uh, honored now as we close the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.